Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee to order, please. I thank everybody for coming tonight. Everybody that's hopefully looking at us on G10. First item on the on our agenda is to the adoption of the agenda. I'd like to have I'd like to have a motion to approve the agenda. I make a motion that we approve tonight's agenda. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Is there any changes or anything anybody feels like needs to be made to it? Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor of this, please signify by raising your right hand. Okay, motion carried. Approval of the minutes of the March 10th, 2016 meeting. Do we have any corrections or anything like that on this? No corrections. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I make the motion to approve the minutes. I make the motion to Mid approve. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Okay, we got that. It's been approved. Inflow and infiltration update. Where's he at? Okay, there you are. <laughs> yeah, you go. Um, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Andrew Cassell. I'm a project manager in the engineering division of, uh, for the city. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about inflow and infiltration, um, or I and I as we like to call it. Uh, we'll talk about what it is, um, how steps that the city undergoes to uh, find and repair I and I. And also, we'll talk about um, current projects that we're working on. So, inflow and infiltration are terms used to describe the way the stormwater and groundwater enter a sanitary sewer system. Um, the picture you see before you is a typical picture of a residential uh, house with underground utilities. shows the connection from the house to a sanitary sewer. Um, inflow is stormwater that enters the sanitary sewer system. So from coming from your house, uh, types of inflow are shown in black here, like your roof drains or foundation drains or even uncapped cleanouts. Um, infiltration is groundwater that enters the sanitary sewer system. Uh, different types of infiltration are ground root intrusion, um, broken sewer services, broken pipes, uh, deteriorated manholes. Any uh, water that is basically entering the sanitary sewer system. So why is I and I bad? Um, I and I is basically once I and I enters the sanitary sewer system, it is treated the same way as wastewater. Uh, so once it enters the system, our it, treatment costs for treating the sanitary sewer obviously go up because we're treating more wastewater than we're actually discharging water, so to say, to the residents. Um, so, which elevates our treatment cost. Uh, another thing that I and I does is, is it raises, um, it increases the sewer capacity uh, on the sewer system. So you get too much I and I in the system. The pipes aren't designed to carry all this extra water. We have problems, and those problems normally lead to sanitary sewer overflows. We there's, or if you have a creek that is draining into the sewer system, or we have a gully washer coming down where we're getting massive amounts of rain, obviously we start getting problems in our sewer system. So once we figure out that we have a problem with I&I, &I, there's steps that have to are involved in order to find it. Uh, and then once we find it, we figure out the best way to repair the source of the I&I. &I. And then once we uh, identify the best repair option, we obviously in implement the repairs. So locating I and I, obviously trying to locate pipes on, uh, any problems on pipes underground is difficult. And the city has a large amount of uh, pipes underground. I think we have any uh, right around 300 miles of pipe underground. So trying to locate a specific source of I and I is 
challenging. So steps that we use for locating INI are flow monitoring, uh, smoke testing, and CCTV inspections. For we'll go into that. So with flow monitoring, we have uh, monitors or meters in at all of our stations. We're looking, uh, our stations are monitored by our lines maintenance. Um, so we're able to see how much water is actually coming into our system and that we can see the spikes. So we'll go out once we have all that information and we put more meters in the sanitary sewer system to try to narrow down specific areas where it's coming from. This process takes a while. It takes at least two to three months to gather enough information where we're seeing the rain events, we're seeing the constant flows coming in, and we take all this data and we analyze it to try to see where the best way, which avenue we need to go down, you know, the locations that have the most INI. Where is this, these items here, these Sir? things, where, you know, where are they put up at, I mean, set up at? Well, this particular meter you see here is a, it's a mag meter, and these ones are installed on our force mains at the pump stations. Okay. So at all of our stations, now we don't have flow meters at all of our stations, but we do have other monitoring methods where I think we can calculate the way, uh, how much a pump is actually pumping and everything. We only have one of them set up then? At each pump station that oh, we okay. have. Right. Um, then we have additional meters that we go in and install in the gravity sewers in we have a few of those. I'm not sure the specific number that we have, but then that's when we start going into the basin uh, upstream of the pump station to try to narrow down which. Uh, now, are these something that we buy, or is they are they a leased item? They're they're leased from a company, or I believe we actually own our own now. Own. Yes, sir. The port we these like you see on the screen are permanently fixed in the pipe. What what's the cost what's the, of something like one of those? Uh, do you know? Uh, the mag meter itself is anywhere from 15 to 25, depending on the size. 1,000. 1,000? 15 Plus, to 25,000, depending on the size of the meter we have. And then there's installation. <coughs> pretty good. And maintenance. <laughs> and then the, um, the individual, the, the portable meters are much less mm -hmm. right but they do require maintenance fees and and upgrades to keep those plus you have to relocate them download the data and again you're only collecting one area at a time so what we're doing is trying to narrow down you know take our basins mm -hmm. and create focus spots that we then go use other methods to look for so you can prioritize what you're going to address. That's right. correct. And he's going to get into some of that in just a minute. Okay. So once we do our flow monitoring, we gather this data of where we see. And one method that we'll go in and do after this is we do smoke testing. Smoke testing tests for inflow. It's not very good with infiltration because infiltration is groundwater. So obviously if the water's coming in, the smoke can't get out. Um, so with smoke testing, what we'll do is we take a blower and we discharge a smoke into the sewer system. And it's a visual inspection where we see, we go and we see where the smoke is coming out. Obviously, if it's coming out, water can get in. So we can narrow down areas of inflow rather quickly. Um, a majority of the problems are just simply uncapped cleanouts, um, which is a quick remedy and fix. And then our other method that we use is CCTV inspection. So once we have the data from the flow uh, monitoring, we'll go in and we identify the, uh, an area that we know we have problems with, and we deploy CCTV inspections, which um, we take a camera and it runs down the sewer line. Uh, an operator is able to see what the, the camera is looking at. As you can see on the left, that's a picture of a, cam uh, a camera that is deployed into the sewer line. Um, the operator then sees the image and is able to notate any areas of in, uh, infiltration or defects in the pipe, which is then recorded and documented so we can come in and uh, identify a repair. The image on the right is actually a picture that we have taken of infiltration in our sewer system. Um, so you can see here, these chains uh, here are attached to the camera, which this particular camera is being dragged through the pipe. This ring you see right here is a joint in the pipe. And this is, this, this 
clear area that you see spraying that looks like fingers coming in is actually infiltration that is pressurized coming into the sewer system. This particular area where this was found, we have a lot of groundwater, so any defect that's in the pipe, it, the water's coming in. So once we figure out where the infiltration's coming in, where the I&I &I is, we go in and we identify the appropriate repair for fixing these. Um, one re option that we have is manhole rehabilitation. So we, if we find a manhole that has a lot of infiltration coming into the manhole, steps that we'll use is injection grouting in order to stop the leak. Um, we'll use hydraulic cement on smaller, on easier fixed leaks. And then we'll come in and uh, completely recoat the inside of a manhole which is deteriorated from sewer gases or there's several smaller leaks coming in. Another repair option that we use is the traditional dig and replace method. We bring out big equipment and if the pipe is collapsed where we can't do a more, uh, more modern uh, type of repair, we actually have to dig up the pipe. Uh, install a new section of pipe and reattach it so we, we can fix the defect and uh, eliminate the I&I. &I. A newer technology that, come, that has come out that we use is a cured in place pipe or CIPP. Uh, this method is great for it, uh, pipes where we have several joints that are leaking like the image that we saw before. The, it, when a CIPP installation is performed like the image you see on the right, it's basically a sock that is lined in a resin that is deployed into the line. It is then pressurized with a steam and allowed to cure the new fiberglass lining, the sock, adheres to the hose pipe and becomes a pipe within the pipe, and it seals off everything. Um, it's a trenchless excavate uh, repair. We're not digging up the world and aggravating everybody to in order to uh, do the repair. What would be like the limit on how far you could go on a cured in place operation? It, um, I'm not positive on the exact footage. I know we have shot liners in the 600 foot range um, where they are able to actually, if we identify two lines and there's a manhole in between, because we have manhole space you know, every four to 500 feet max, they'll actually shoot through the manhole and line the separate two sections at one time and then come back and they cut everything out in order to reinstate the uh, sewer line how it should be. But if they can go farther than that, I would imagine they we just, I, I'm not sure as to how far. Is well, there a limit on the diameter of the pipe? The, um, as far as I know, no. <laughs> um, everything that I've seen, they can line anything from a small four inch service, and I've seen liners go out as big as uh, 60, 80 inch pipe. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Greg. This here is actually uh, a CIPP liner. Um, so you see here, this is the hose pipe. Uh, this was a sample taken from one of our job sites. Um, so th this would be the hose pipe in the ground. The interior liner you see here is the CIPP liner, which is shot through and then it's pressurized. It cures in place. Um, it's basically a fiberglass pipe, so to say. Mm -hmm. And once this uh, CIPP liner is installed, no matter the condition of the hose pipe, it basically is its own pipe. And then it's also seamless, and it's a, it's a really great uh, technology. Why don't you send that around? What would you not be able to use that for in what the circumstances? Only, the biggest thing we have um, is whenever a pipe is collapsed oh. or misaligned to the point where that sock cannot be blown through it. Gotcha. Okay. And for those, we'll go in, we'll do the traditional excavation <clears throat> repair. Mm -hmm. But if there's still several leaks on it, we'll do a small point repair and then still come back and install the liner in order to just have a new pipe. Yep. Do you know what estimated life expectancy of that is? They give us a guarantee of 50 years. Really? But obviously, if they're going to guarantee it for 50 years, we're going to hope we can get, you know, 100 years out of it. Just wow. answer my question, though. <laughs> How long the thing lasts? Yep. Why don't you talk about the challenges of that in a neighborhood where you have taps? Okay, um, so this liner is installed as one seamless bag. And in a neighborhood where you have several connections to that particular section of pipe, well, the residents aren't allowed to use their, uh, they can use their commodes and their wastewater for a little while, but it's not able to discharge into the pipe while the pipe is curing. It normally takes anywhere from two to three hours to cure. So 
door hangers are hung and we tell everybody, please don't use your commodes or wash dishes or anything until we're done with our operations. Well, once we're done with our, uh, the, once the pipe is cured and it is uh, completely hardened like the one we saw, they will uh, deploy a robotic cutter into the pipe and reinstate everybody's services mm -hmm. by cutting out uh, the individual service, mm -hmm. which most of the time it goes very smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times it doesn't. <laughs> so it's what a happens? fun process. Misalignment. Sometimes everywhere where there's a uh, service connection, there's normally a dimple in the liner, mm -hmm. which is the best way to find it. So then go ahead and start cutting and then it really becomes an art. These guys that mm -hmm. do this work have done it so much. Uh, I don't know how they can see and move that joystick. Um, other times you can't see the dimple, and it comes down to they basically are guessing. And when that happens, then we have to install a sectional to fix all the little holes that they put in the brand new liner. Um, that's pretty much the heart uh, heartaches with. Uh, it can't you know. go through the cleanouts clean of the house. Um, if they can't, I don't think. I don't think they have a cutter that will go that long and then cut straight in. If they do, they have. I haven't seen them use that. Not every house has a clean up. That's, That's our other. True. Yes. Um, <coughs> is there a thought of running the camera down and seeing how many feet each one is prior? They do that. They do that they prior do that. to putting in the uh, the liner. Mm -hmm. They ha they go in and they do an extensive um, cleaning of the pipe, a cleaning that. Uh, Pete and his guys would not do because the way they clean it, there's a possibility that it could collapse. They basically try to clean it to where it's a new pipe. Um, and when they're doing this cleaning, they're running their camera down and locating every service and documenting how far they are. So but, the company that you contract with to come in to do this? Yes, What's but, the cost per foot? The, um, our last project that we had come in for 8-inch pipe was running right around the $30 a foot mark to install this uh, liner now obviously the bigger the pipe the more it goes up uh, we had a price for 18 inch come in right around 120 dollars a foot so it's it slowly creeps um, but then you outweigh the benefits with what would it take to inconvenience everybody in order to dig up the roadway and pay for asphalt curb and gutter everything else so it's a it, it's a give and take and really what's the best way most cost effective way in order to repair the line is significantly cheaper. Yeah. And you don't have joints afterwards money. either. And then there's, I mean, we're in and out in a matter of hours. Is it hard to schedule with this company or are they pretty good? We put up, well, once we put out the bid and we get them in, it's, we can normally get them here within a few months after we award the contract, but it is, there's only so many people that do it in do the it. United States. So right. Trying to get them here is, uh, okay. can be difficult. So some of the cities prior, uh, but I and I is an ongoing battle. Um, like I said, what we do smoke testing, and you, we all identify, you know, cleanouts that are broken. We'll go ahead and fix them real quick. The next day after we've done our testing, somebody may come out and hit a client clean out with a lawnmower, and we're right back. So we're, we're, it's an endless battle with I and I. Um, the city has adopted a program where one fiscal year we go out and we locate and we design how we're going to fix uh, what areas we're going to identify to repair I&I &I. and then the following year we issue construction. Um, over the past few years I think we've done several I&I &I projects which have dramatically decreased I&I. Uh, &I. Our current I&I &I projects we, we split uh, construction into a CIPP project and a point repair project. We split them out, try to divide the trades, see if we can get a little better price uh, for the work. Um, that project is currently underway. Uh, it's going smoothly from right now, and we're actually adding work to the project as we're uh, lines maintenance is finding more work. The maps that were handed out are location maps for those two projects that are going on. It, it is citywide. Uh, it's just uh, we try to identify the biggest areas of I-9. And coming up here in fiscal year 17 is going to be our year for design and locate. Um, so we'll be out smoke testing again, running cameras down lines, and trying to identify some other areas of uh, I&I. Andrew, if somebody does find a broken clean-out or they break their clean-out, what, what, for the residents, what, what should be their process? What should they do? Uh, I would 
believe the best way would be to call in to City Hall, the public services, and let us know that it's going on. Um, we'll and we'll then replace we, it for free. Yes. And just tell us, we'll, we'll send somebody out to replace it. The cap is only a dollar fifty cent, and it's a whole lot more to treat that eye and eye than for me to give them a twenty out cap to screw it back on. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, ma'am. So in quick, um, I and I obviously it costs a tremendous amount to treat I and I. It's unwanted wastewater that's in the sewer system. It I and I is an ongoing process. We're always finding new areas uh, that we need to repair, and new areas are popping up all the time that we don't know that we have to go out and try to find. And this process will go is will go on for a while. It's just because I don't know what's a clean out look like could I have one on my property and not even know yes, yes ma'am it's a white cap, white cap about four inches diameter usually close to the curbing it, it may have a square nut that's raised up or it may have a slot in it I've yeah. seen those yeah no I don't have those unless okay. you yeah, had a blockage <laughs> or something during the past usually they're like they're <clears throat> fiberglass plastic plastic, plastic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. but the it's yeah. like a plastic nut that sticks yes. I've seen those on, on property that's yeah right. okay brass how, how many basins? brass one that screws in? Yeah. yeah, we had the brass ones too. They're easier to detect yeah. with a metal locator or with a poke rod than the plastic ones, and they're a little bit more durable. Is that like a newer thing or something? Like if you have an older home, you might not have one? That's correct. Okay. How many basins do we service? Different that, basins. Nine basins, I guess. Yeah. And then there's sub basins inside that. And which ones are the worst? Aren't there? Have you identified the, the older ones? areas of Jacksonville are obviously going to be the worst classic, um, yeah. because the pipes in those areas are older and they've outlived their life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's just the older areas of Jacksonville. And now on the newer areas of Jacksonville, there are areas where things were done poorly, or just there's open connections that we're trying to find. Question, and, and I know we've talked about you. Know, what percentage of the incoming flow to the wastewater treatment plant is from I and I and and we can't just say okay if we have five million gallons being processed and sent out to folks we have six million coming in well, it's a one million difference because part of that five million might be not going into the sewer it might be yeah. going to wash cars fill pools do something you know, irrigate lawn so what percentage do we think is actually we added in we've looked at it in and we've said this before I think we're somewhere probably around 30 percent on average um, and some of it even if we came in and had a brand new system there would still be I and I um, and and some of it is on purpose for example every restaurant that has a dumpster pad is required to run that dumpster pad which is open to air to the grease trap which comes to our sewer system to rainfall so rainfall comes, hits the dumpster pad, mm -hmm. and because of the possible contaminants related to the dumpster, grease and other, it goes to our sewer system. Mm -hmm. So even if we had brand new pipes, we would still have mm -hmm. things like that. In, in like Andrew said, broken cleanouts or missing cleanouts, or um, I wish we had a picture of it, but we've seen people take their cleanout cap off. And because that happens to be just a little bit lower spot in their yard, drain. they'll put a drain cap on and drain the low spot in their yard, which is bad for us. <laughs> so, but it's finding and educating those. You know, that yeah. a lot of it is homeowners, they just don't know. So a lot of this is education also. And they're having to pay for that, too. <laughs> they are. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to increase capacity. Um, on the dumpster pads, uh, are any of them being made a little bit higher than the asphalt around them so that the stormwater runoff landing on the rest of the asphalt isn't all going to that drain as well? A lot of it depends on the site, but yes, we typically try to isolate the dumpster pads so that, you know, it the whole collects. Mm -hmm. parking lot doesn't drain into right. it. Right, it collects what's in the dumpster pad. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Do all the manholes in Jasper have caps on them? Lids? The rain no. guards. The rain, oh, guards. the rain guards? Yeah. No. No, but I know that that's something that Pete is constantly looking at and identifying and installing. And for those that don't know what Mr. Terry is talking about, is if you were to pull the metal, you know, the metal cap, 
it's typically vented, has holes in it, mm -hmm. has a hook where you can put a hook in it and pull the metal lid off. Mm -hmm. um, it's open straight down. Well, they make this little plastic dish, for lack of a better term, that slips right in underneath that metal ring so that water that runs in through the, the manhole oh. lid is collected in that plastic dish and doesn't just dump straight into our sewer system. I mean, I ask because some of these heavy rains, a lot of these streets are underwater. That's right. Mm -hmm. And flowing into it would be a big source of infiltration right there. That's right. That's what I was asking. Mm -hmm. So when you say that not all of them have it, are like the priority spots, like the, the ones that Mr. Terry just mentioned, those, those lower areas that collect water, are, are those the main ones you've gone and put them in? Yeah, I, I've, I've told staff that anytime they see a manhole that doesn't have one, to put one in it. We have them in stock on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And some of them carry some on their trucks. I tell them if it doesn't have one, put one in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there's some that we haven't got to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the ones that are elevated obviously don't need them, but they're not in eyesight. Mm -hmm. but they're elevated above ground level, so they're not an issue. They're not an issue. <clears throat> if the cap prevents water from getting in, does it prevent sewage from getting out? No, it will not. <laughs> the hydraulic pressure will push it off. It'll lift the, yeah. the metal lids off as we used to see and you know, we used to observe that in Barn Street. It actually yeah. raised the manhole right there at the, <clears throat> in the dip in Barn Street an inch or two and let the water run right out underneath. Yeah, I got a house there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I have not seen that problem since we no, made the I repairs on Barn and Jarman. Yeah, that's right. It used to be bad there. It did. Um, talking about manholes, an, another thing that we have in our system, I know a lot of people have seen the precast metal rings and you know manholes around so cylindrical cone coming up. Um, you know, in a lot of our older system, that's our actually all brickwork. So, and anybody that has an, an older brick house knows that you know the mortar works its way out of the bricks and you know hydraulic pressure pushes on them and they can be sources so and those are some of the ones that we identify for coating also Greg can you think of anything we may have missed inflow and infiltration are two different things we see significance bikes and what comes to our plant when it rains. Mm -hmm. But that's because the water is running almost directly into the sewer through these clean outs and other openings. Um, this last set of rainfall, what what was the what was the the highest flow you saw during this last rainfall? The we only um, average for the day was it was around six, six and a half. We wasn't like the normal spikes that we see because we, we kind of dodged a bullet. Well, we do have spikes that go up in the, in the upper teens, mm. and when our average daily is running around, what, around the high four, low five yeah, million gallons per day, we have some instantaneous spikes that equate to something like, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19 million gallons per day, and so that is why it's important to, you know, if you got a clean out that's off, you know, put it back on. Um, because that really, really puts us in a bind when we see that much flow. Yeah. Oh, they're not glued shut or something? No, it's the cap is threaded because if it's at the if it's at the right of way, that's what we'll use as part of our free service. If you call us with a blockage, mm -hmm. it's between the clean out at the curb or the right of way and uh -huh. the main. We will use that access point to jet it out and clean it out oh, with okay. free service. Um, so it's typically it's threaded. So they're just screwed on? Yes, ma'am. Well, how do the caps get lost? People hit them with lawnmowers or Lawn something? Lawnmowers, juvenile delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> They'll pull them off intentionally to drain that area. Somebody finds a piece of brass, takes the yep. recycling yard. Oh, my. Okay. Oh. Pulls up onto their uh, their curb area there to park and just hit it. Hits it. Okay. Okay. Do your guys keep a lookout for yes. them? They all they all know if there's if there's a clean out that's missing the cap or broken... They have you have stuff those on, on stock in stock yeah. too. The, the trucks are rolling inventory. It's it's on <coughs> okay. the trucks. All right. Okay. Uh, 
take a walk around the neighborhood and you see a broken one. <laughs> They're not in my neighborhood. It's too old. I don't have any in mind. Well, you, could, you can get them added back on in. If, if they have to come in and fix something, you'll add them back on in. Because I've seen them in some areas that they've been added into. Yeah, that's what I've never seen Thanks, one Andrew, in our neighborhood. I appreciate it. Thank you. Can you back the first yeah. one of that on there? My, my tap in to oh, the pipe? Yeah. Well, the first picture. Right, and they came in and they fixed yeah. that section of the pipe because okay, it was right tap, and they put a clean Then put one in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Storm cross connection. Storm water. Is there a pipe that goes between those two, or what? What That's is that? What that connection is. Um, well, how are you keeping from the sewage coming down one pipe from going over to the one that's going out in the river that's not being drained? In the older part of uh, Jacksonville, there were I, when Jacksonville was first done. There was areas like this that we had cross connections. Um, since then, we have identified, I believe. Almost everything that we know, well, we have everything we know that we have had, we went in and severed that connection. Um, if there's any more left in Jacksonville, we just haven't found it yet. And I didn't know if you had a one way connection where it wouldn't go, you know, that stay <laughs> on one side or what. It was, no, they're, supposed, they're supposed to be two separate systems. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think most of what you would find is actually the drop inlet in the street, it's just tied into the sewer system. Although we do have some places in town where you have conflicts, so you may have a stormwater pipe running through a manhole or through a, you know, a junction box <clears throat> for the sewer system, and which is absolutely fine as long as that stormwater pipe doesn't start leaking. So, but we and those are sometimes those are unavoidable, mm -hmm. but they're typically designed for that. And, and when it, one way you, you find those is when you do your smoke tests. We That's correct. Be coming up. So and I think that would be a good thing that. So if we were smoke testing this, things that would be obvious is smoke coming out here. See this roof drain that they're saying is connected in. You would have smoke coming out here. Of course, this is the vent stack, so you, we would expect smoke to come out there. And uncapped. Clean um, out. We have the uncapped clean out. And of course, the root intrusion, like Andrew said, you know, it's it's hard for the smoke to get, you know, to push out against the water that's coming in. But it is possible that you do see some seeping out through the yard. But those would be the obvious ones. <laughs> that's your report. Okay. Awesome. Mr. Deaver. Sir. Blue Frog. Yes, sir. Well, again, good evening, Council. Uh, excuse me, Committee. Board, the Advisor Committee. Mr. <laughs> Councilman Thomas. Um, several, several meetings ago, Mr. Hanson made a brief presentation about a product that we were very interested in called, the company's called Absolute Aeration, but the product itself is called Blue Frog. It's the bio dredging um, system that if performs as it has been uh, presented to us would be a considerable cost savings for us. We, through much deliberation and communication between our attorney and the uh, company that provided it and city council allowing us a sole source option, uh, we have moved forward with this project. Um, and I am very pleased to say that as of 5.30 last night, the system was completely installed, tested, and is up and running. Um, official startup for this product project was at 8 o'clock this morning. Um, from this point forward, we are in a two-year pilot program with uh, absolute aeration using these bio dread, uh, excuse me, blue frog um, aeration units. Uh, you can see this a picture of them. The two on the left are just had the cover. The two on the right are uncovered. Um, just that's just the way they came, so we could so we could work on them, get them wired up. Um, Looks like spaceships have landed. We, do. We, 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 we were having fun. We were going to hang it up in the crane and put a light in it and spin it around at nighttime and see how many <laughs> we could get. But, uh, the, the unit itself is about uh, seven, eight feet diameter. It weighs a little less than 500 pounds. Um, and there you can see this, the, the rope. Uh, they're tethered together in sequence. Uh, all 14 are in one, the middle, what we call the middle train pond. It was replacing the six... 10 horsepower aerators that we had, they were physically removed. It, this, this photo shows all 14 of them in place, um, and that is how they're going to be. You can kind of see the ropes that tether them together. Uh, this process 
And we started it up last night. We literally started seeing the little, what I call champagne bubbles is what I put in my email to everybody. Um, we can see, and it was actually starting to bring the water back to life. So as these bubbles, no, not the bubbles, the, as the sludge becomes organic and it starts to eat itself, that's the beginning process. And it's just going to sit there and, and digest itself and reduce uh, the initial projections that they're saying is roughly 25% reduction in the first three months. Um, then during the next uh, four, five, six months, we won't see a whole lot of reduction. But then as the last quarter of the first year, uh, we should see some more significant reduction. And they're projecting we should be down to between one and two feet of um, inorganic sludge in the bottom of the lagoon at, at the, after that 12 month. But um, in the um, agreement that uh, Mr. Hansen and Mr. Michal and I was involved in with Blue Frog, we're doing this as a two-year study uh, so we can have some sound scientific data. Uh, Mr. Michal wrote a letter to the state that got it that uh, basically said this was a maintenance activity and didn't have to be uh, permit modification done. And we'll be doing um, daily sludge measurements using a weighted disc that Blue Frog provided with us as per the agreement. Um, and essentially what that does is it just, it's a, it's a disc it just goes down into the water and it gets on the sludge, it hits a certain point and, and then it measures the depth of the water from that point up. And then basically what we're doing is measuring that depth and as the sludge dissolves, that reading should get, that water should get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then um, and that, that is how we're going to be measuring it. What was the reading when you started? Uh, using the weighted disc, it was, we were bouncing around. They did yesterday when they split that basically split that pond into nine squares mm -hmm. and we were averaging between 10 and a half and 11 depth. Um, I did at the manager's request, we did hire a third party to come in and do a measurement using a sludge judge, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit different than this weighted disc method, but we do have third party mapping mm -hmm. of this very same lagoon. And if the, if the product doesn't perform as they guarantee it does, we have a letter of credit on file where we would get 75% of our money back. Okay. Um, so it is a very solid warranty. We are the first municipal wastewater system in the state of North Carolina to do this. Um, and the largest. And the largest. Everybody else has been much smaller than us. Our concern has always been the detention time in the pond, um, and we made them aware of that up front. So uh, like I said, this morning was official startup. And we're measuring the sludge every day, Monday through Friday. I think the first, the first week in our letter, we measure the sludge once a day for the first five days for the first week. Then the second three weeks, Greg, is three times a week. Three times a week. Three times a week. And then the fourth week and, and consecutively after that, during the pilot program, we measure it once, once a week. Um, and we measure the same spot every time. We have a, a rope going across with a marking on it, so we know we can shimmy the boat out there, drop it down in that same location, and we're within a three-foot mm -hmm. diameter of that exact location every time. And we're also measuring, um, comparing the other two lagoons to this with the old aeration process versus this new aeration process to see. Um, Plus, we're sampling the wastewater coming out of this lagoon to make sure that we stay in compliance with okay. doing all the other mm -hmm. testing we normally do uh, on the effluent from these lagoons. So we'll, we'll take that one individually and then we'll compare it to the other two. And this is in the old lagoons, not in the new one that was just built? This is in the middle lagoon of the three, directly okay. behind the headwork. So it is one of the, if I'm not mistaken, one of the original lagoons. Now will sometime in the future be some of these put in the new lagoon. I know that doesn't have that much sludge in it now because it hadn't been the in six, operation. But. He's talking about the South Lagoon. Yeah, no, no, the South Lagoon, no. That has, we never measured the sludge in that, but all the sludge is in these aeration lagoons. We did not measure the South or the East Lagoon for any type of sludge at any time. We did measure the West, and we found that the West, back in um, 2015, I think it was... Uh, I don't remember June or somewhere in that about middle of the year. It uh, it had less than two feet in it, so we're di we just we're just leaving it alone. Uh, we're concentrating on this. When I when we did the measurements originally, it was estimated that there was around 12 million gallons of sludge in these lagoons. Uh, that's a considerable amount of 
capacity that we could free up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, with our detention time for the treatment process, it would it would give us more treatment time. How do you get that water so blue? <laughs> that is actually from the wind, and um, the the old aerators we took out were taken offline on Friday, previous last Friday, and this lagoon was valved off until yesterday, or excuse me, this morning. It's until this morning. It's also reflecting the sky. Yeah, this picture was with the sun to my back. I took this picture about 6 o'clock last night. It looks like that they should use that in their ads. Those, those lines that we see, those are curtains, right? Those are the baffles, that's those correct. We had to install, that was part of the process. We installed two of them. Two of them were existing, which gave us that serpentine action. And then the two new ones are the closest ones to the boom, to the aerators. Those are only three feet deep. And, and that allows that water to do that process to digest itself and, and uh, in situ and, and then it'll just move through the train and then go on. Um, and like uh, Mr. Mr. Michal said, we're pulling samples out of all the lagoons upstream, downstream. We're doing a lot of sampling, a lot of data accumulation. Um, and we are required to send this, this data to the state quarterly. We will be sending it to Blue Frog staff probably weekly um, with the depth measurements. And then they will uh, analyze that data and then the president of the company and their chief engineer, I don't know his official title, Chip, they will be back here in 30 days to, to see how things are going. Then they will be back in six months to do their own measurements again. And then at that time, six months from now, we'll be close to budgeting and I'll get with Mr. Hansen and say, you know, do we want to keep going with the pilot program? Do we want to kill it? Do we want to you know, start budgeting for the rest of them. So we just have to wait and see what those numbers show us. Yes, ma'am. Silly question, but water level goes up and down depending on what's going on. So are you doing that depth to a standard consistent height? No, what, what we're going to be doing is we'll be watching the flows that they, if they increase or decrease, and then we'll, we'll factor that in at that time. I mean, if you had a stand marker that was your zero and just... We, no, we, we, we do not... We'll, we'll know, if the, if the, obviously, if the flows go up, the lagoon levels are going to rise automatically, and we'll just, have to, we'll just have to make a notation of that when we do it. But I, I mentioned um, that because of the animal waste lagoons. They, they do have that, so when right. they do their surveys, it's from that standard mark, so they've got a consistent Yeah, we, we, have, we have thought about that, but we just haven't. We're so, in the very beginning of this, we still haven't fully ironed all that out yet, but we know where we're going to take it at. But we don't have a true like benchmark 0, 0.0 elevation to go off of yet. Yeah. So anything that you 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 put that add along the side and you made your measurements, you just read where that water existing water level is compared to your your marker yes. above below, and it just makes the math a lot easier and right. consistent. Can you clarify something for me? You said it was a two-year pilot project, but yes, you were talking about next year. Do you have the option of pulling out after 12 months if you're extremely unhappy or something? The benchmarks are based on one year of data oh. with Blue Frog. Mm -hmm. The two year pilot study is with the state to give us time to make adjustments, um, get everything in place, get it ordered, installed, which we've achieved that. Right. But then, if you know, to give us time, should we need to make adjustments past that? Um, you know, one of the if they perform as expected, it's obviously a no-brainer. Right. If it does something but doesn't quite meet the benchmarks we've set, mm -hmm. then we have decisions because ultimately they should pull less um, electricity, mm -hmm. so they should be cheaper to operate. They are um, easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. So there, there's still some advantages mm -hmm. aside from the sludge digestion um and while i've got the screen up one thing i want to point out of course this screen you can kind of tell that they aren't running but if you look at the background kind of over here those are the old aerators that we have and we still have in other lagoons so you can kind of see the water coming up whereas this one these are actually running so if you look you can see it kind of here you see the water bubbling out and moving <laughs> horizontally across the surface and breaking the surface tension and of course back here you see the old aerators how they throw water up in the air 
can you kind of a little explain for the people watching on G10 process of how this works? I think I'll, I'll mention that what I noticed during the presentations and stuff, basically all it's doing is rerouting the flow in, internally, yeah. right? I mean, it's just changing the way the water circulates under the, I mean, there's no chemicals, there's no anything different, no, it's just but a they movement. Have, they have what they call a seed, is that what they called it? <laughs> Yes. Come to the table, please. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Because if not, right, so they got secret sauce. They got secret <laughs> yeah, sauce. Yeah. So the the uh, Greg knows much more than me, but <laughs> when you run these in reverse, it creates cavitation, which causes a reaction that they call seedlings or something. And as it it drops down, those create bacteria that start adhering and adhering yeah. to the seed. <laughs> it's sort of um, it's sort of aeration technology meets uh, a sludge upflow blanket type treatment system. What they say is that uh, I always find it hard to to explain it, but um, what they say is that this uh, technology promotes the growth of uh, uh, seeds. And so what happens is a seed forms, and on this seed, bacteria grows. Well, that bacteria is circulated by the uh, motion of, uh, of the unit. And as it circulates through the wastewater, it, it, eats all, it eats organics. And it eats it very efficiently because the bacteria are adhered to the seed and all their energy goes to eating. What they also say is that unlike regular aerators, these um, units take some of the bacteria that's free floating, if you will, and it, they, the, the units lyse them. That means they basically puncture the cell wall and the enzymes of the bacteria go into the solution and these enzymes promote um, the, you know, the, the, the bacteria feeding on the organic material that's in the wastewater. The reaction goes much faster. And so, you know, you've, you've added enzymes to the system. You know, you've heard about taking enzymes yourself. You know, but, you know, certain enzymes help you digest certain foods. Other types of enzymes help you, you know, digest other kinds of foods. So it, it makes the reaction go more efficiently and it makes it go faster. And so basically what happens is these seeds circulate around and there is a zone in the in the wastewater near the top where there's this layer, and I can't remember the technical term for it, but you know the the seeds come up and they hit this uh, this. Uh, it's almost like surface tension, but it's not surface tension. It's below the water. It hits it, and it forces the oxygen off of the seed, and so the seed falls back down, and it just it just it's you know. Continuous cycle. It's, a, it's, it's just the seed keeps circulating around, and it keeps eating the food, and it, voila, uh, eventually, you know, it eats up uh, the sludge that we have accumulated in the bottom of the lagoon. And if you go out there right now, I was out there today, in that first cell, you'll notice that these units have uh, essentially stirred up the sludge that was on the bottom because the water is, unlike the rest of it that's sort of brownish or bluish or whatever, that wastewater in that first cell is almost black right now. So, so it's just starting the process. And, you know, they basically say, we'll see a little bit of results in three months, but we will really see results in six months. So that's what we're looking for. And to the two-year thing with the state, you know, if it's performing extremely well after a year, I'm sure that we can say to the state, you know, we want to be off the pilot program and, you know, we want these uh, to be our permanent fix. Is that going to make it either easier if it does work well for other municipalities to start using it? I would say it would make them uh, more willing to use it. See, yeah. we've been, I mean, we have been back and forth with these guys for Yeah, you've done the hard work. For a year. For I mean, I've, I've written, yeah. we, myself and their chief engineer have just been going at it back and forth right. for, I don't know, six months or more yeah. before, you know, I finally got to the point that said, you know, I'm not quite sure 
you know, if this was a permit modification, I wouldn't quite know how to seal this work as an engineer. So what I proposed to the state was, because this is sort of new technology that really does not have any calculations that you can use to describe the reactions, what I want to do is the pilot study, and then if the pilot study is successful, you know, we'll all be comfortable and can go forward. And after the presentation, I talked to the, uh, I guess, the lead guy at the state, and he said, I understand exactly what you're saying. He said, you know, there are certain things out there that uh, in other states, and this guy came from another state, he's now with North Carolina, that there are no calculations to describe how it works, but it works. Yeah. And so that's what we're, we're after, to see if this works. And if it works, it opens the door for a lot of other folks. Greg, from that lagoon, does the water go to another lagoon prior to being sprayed out, or is it sprayed it out goes from to that the, lagoon? Again, these lagoons that have the aeration device in, devices in them are the, essentially the treatment lagoons. This is where the wastewater is treated. Then it's either directed to the, uh, the south storage lagoon or the east-west lagoon, as I call it. And those lagoons are essentially nothing more than for storage. So one of the things you're going to... You, you mentioned this one's turned black, so is one of the things you're going to be looking at is if the solids in the others go up so that you don't have to worry about higher solids being sprayed out and the potential for problems from that? That's well, one of our things. major concerns. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. And that's why we're, we're actually testing all three trains. So this is a portion of one train. Mm -hmm. So it's being tested and compared against the performance of our existing train. But I would say with those large lagoons, let's say some solid, more solids than usual get escaped. They're so large that they they act as... Uh, should settle before. They should settle. Okay. These, you know, they're not only storage lagoons, but they're also, you know, I, I call them, even though they're not intended, polishing lagoons. They allow for a little bit more treatment mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's probably, there's a little bit of organics left in the water. And so, you know there's additional digestion of food going on in those lagoons, those large lagoons, but that's not their, their primary purpose. It's just for storage. And you mentioned you don't measure the sludge in those other ones at this time. No. We, we are measuring the west. All, the, we're measuring <coughs> all three of the oh. 10 horsepower yes. lagoons daily. The, well, the, but you're not measuring the sludge in them. Yes, we are. Oh, okay. We're you using know, a weighted sorry. disc to measure all three, All three of the larger 10 horsepower lagoons to compare the sludge depth to the two original aeration processes to the blue frog. Yeah, so what we have is we have a, a, an initial treatment lagoon that has, uh, that's separate from this long lagoon that has 50, 50 horsepower, Correct. 50 Four horsepower uh, aerators in them. And yeah, then from, you're looking at, yeah, yeah and actually. from those lagoons, those lagoons are connected to this long lagoon that has these uh, blue frogs in them in this lagoon, which previously had several 10 horsepower uh, units in it. And from there, out of these long lagoons, again, this is a treatment lagoon, the flow goes into the large east-west and south storage lagoon for storage. So there's a treatment train. You've got a, a lagoon with 50 horsepower aerators in it that's separate. Then it flows directly into this long lagoon where the blue frogs are to receive additional treatment, and then the wastewater is discharged into the storage lagoons, where it, and then it's eventually sprayed. So with the measurements that you're taking, you'll be able to determine that with all the stirring up, any additional solids that are in it is suspended and going into the storage lagoons over a 12-month period, you didn't just move the solids from one to another. That's, we will pick that up through our sampling of the effluent because we'll be looking at TSS, total suspended solids. And so you'll be able to then extrapolate yeah. on that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Following up on this, um, one of the things that we're planning to do now that it's in operation um, is have possibly our August meeting out at LTS so that we can tour this along with some other things that we've accomplished recently with daylighting and pod maintenance and um, some of the other efforts out there.
Pete, is that all you have on the? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Farm <Farmer> boy. <laughs> You have an update on the goats? I do. We have looked at goats and goats and more goats. And <laughs> the possibility of their use at um, the land application site. And I can tell you, I've learned a lot through looking at some of this. And there are actually um, people in North Carolina that use herds of goat and come out and actually do clearing of areas. Mm -hmm. um, so there's actually quite a bit of information available. Um, unfortunately, at this point, we don't think it's the right application for land app. I'll give you a few reasons why. Um, one, everything that we found is they've pretty much got to be tended while they're there. Um, and because of natural predators, it's not like we could just pin them up in an area and leave them. Um, you another need a challenge. Goat herder. <laughs> You laugh, but we That's truly exactly we would. What you need um, to go and from what we found, they actually come as packages, uh -huh. and the herder comes with them. Mm -hmm. And the way they do it is, you know, they they'll section off an area, fence off an area, and they leave the goats in that area. And then, as you know, as the goats eat and progress, they'll actually open up other areas and move them. That does create some challenges us challenges for us. Um, and one of the things that um, William was, you know, very point, pointful on is that we need the cutting and growing process. Vegetation is our friend. That, that really helps us in the uptake and the usage of the water that we're applying out in our fields. Um, that said, I did find some interesting um, comments. There's actually a lady in Durham that has... Um, a goat herd that she rents out and I actually was able to get pricing from her. Um, unfortunately, she won't travel this far. Um, I did find a few in this area that we make it work with. Um, but one of the things she's looking at, at expanding into, um, which in the future possibly could be a benefit for us, is easement clearing. Um, we have uh, requirements to go through and you know, maintain our easements and our right-of-ways. Mm -hmm. And in some of those areas, it's very difficult to get machines and those kind of things into. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that she actually mentioned that she's looking at expanding her business into. Um, basically, the pricing I got from her, and I thought this was pretty funny, but, you know, it, it, it all varies just a little bit. But it's um, basically 75 cent per hour per goat. <laughs> <laughs> So they, um, the goats eat between 8 and 12 hours a day. They'll pretty much eat everything, um, which is one of the challenges of LTS. They would definitely have to be monitored, especially in lateral areas because they will chew on wood and plastic. Um, so that could cause us some problems. Um, but if you think about easements that are harder to access and get to, there really is some potential there. Um, they use them in the they, western part of the state to clear really steep hills and stuff and kudzu and stuff, and they will leave ground like all you have to do is come in and turn it. Yeah, it, and it looks bare when they're finished. Yeah, it does. Which is, it does. Which is one of William's major concerns. Yeah. We need the vegetation. Right. Um, but, it, you know, and, and part of it is it, there are some interesting YouTube videos that... <laughs> So anybody that's interested, go look at it. But, you know, they talk about how it is truly a green process mm -hmm. because the goats come in, they eat it. There's no fossil fuel burned mm -hmm. other than to get them to your site. Um, you know, whatever comes out is fertilizer. fertilizer. A lot of it they take with them um, to digest. So it was, it was definitely interesting to look into. And there may be some potential usage for, you know, the easement thing really was interesting because there are some areas, now I wouldn't get out the, you know, the large trees that Pete's people have to deal with from time to time, but it may be able to get to areas that we typically wouldn't easily be able to get a machine into and clear. It, it could make it so that as people are trying to get into those large trees, it clears out everything else around them. That is true. All those briars and brambles. So, um, you know, I have a, a few other interesting tidbits if you're if you're interested in them um but 
Lori's the... going to get a herd of goats. <laughs> <laughs> the little pygmy ones are cute. They're adorable. You know? They're, they really are. Yeah. But, um, and it's funny because they went through one of the, actually one of the videos I found actually showed that, you know, they when they bring them to a site, they go out and they kind of explore what the food source is. And you mentioned kudzu. That's apparently okay. one of their favorites. They love it. They do it. Yeah. Um, so they start there and, and work back. Of course, thankfully, we don't have a large kudzu right. problem here. But um, And they did say that you have to be very careful because they will eat all the way down to the ground. Yeah, you need to pull them out. So. If you don't want it totally cleared, you have to get yes. them to pull the next section. Yeah. Um, wow. And you kind the, of pick how much you want it cleared. That's right. And the yeah. way that... Um, in three different um, I I examples they that I saw, the part. they use the orange construction fencing, mm -hmm. and they have they basically have areas or links pre-designated, and she backs her trailer up, pulls that out of the trailer first, sets up the pen, and then she has to stay with them. And the, the um, both of them that I saw. It's mostly to make sure, you know, because that stuff is flexible, that the do goats don't get out of the pen mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, she mm -hmm. opens up areas because sometimes they'll actually eat faster than what you would have expected. Um, so it's making sure that you have additional areas to open up. So, and then one that I found mentioned that for, I don't remember the exact um, number, but I think it was for maybe six goats or eight goats and their herder, um, it was $250 a day or something like that. Ooh. So there's, um, you know, they mentioned that a lot of, it, it's apparently fairly popular in the Durham Chapel Hill area. Oh yeah. Don't miss that anything. There. You can you can you have the first. Did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> just took um, you too long. You can do the first there. week. Yeah. Or you can do the second week. I can tell you, <laughs> William and I sat down and talked about this multiple times. Was, <laughs> Is that right? And we did. And um, and and really, his biggest concern comes back to, you know, vegetation and the You're fact that you were scared they would clear it too far. Yes, and the, the fact that we have to, you know, we we do changeover in the middle of the day. Right. So we would have to be very careful about laying out areas. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, to quote William directly, he's, you know, he said, at least when we turn the mower off, it stops eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't have an off switch. They yeah. don't. Yeah. Uh, this area can six goats clear out in a day's time. Um, they, one of the, she gave us square footage, but I don't remember. And I, I get a couple of, because I was, there were, there's a lot of literature out there, but most of them said that, um, you know, an area like a, a normal backyard, and I assumed in a, a residential subdivision, they can take care of in a day pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Wow. So. They're eating machines. Huh? They are that. They eight, are. eight to 12 hours a day they eat. Yeah. <laughs> so. Any other questions on the oh, Well, thanks for looking into it. You're welcome. There, there could be some opportunities there, though, for easement yeah. clearing. I think you ought to partner with the 4-H or the Boy Scouts or something to <laughs> yeah. get them to manage it for you. Then you can buy your own goats. Buy your own go goats. Yeah. Then you can sell them when they're fat. <laughs> uh, and that's a good job. Actually, um, two of the different... <clears throat> people that I found said that it, initially that was the intent is that they would use them to clear and then when they got to a certain point they'd sell them and then they got so attached they couldn't sell them <laughs> <laughs> and there are goat adoption agencies too if you're interested I found those <laughs> too well you've got an update on the grant from the NC State yes sir um, okay. I know I've kind of giving you just a little bit of information a couple of times about uh, NC State approached us with a grant opportunity at LTS looking at um, the waste the effectiveness of our treatment system on wastewater as it relates to 
um, items that we're not required to test for. And some of those that I mentioned the last time are personal care products, PCPs. Um, you know, those, those can be skin lotions, conditioners, soaps. Um, all of those are designed for humans to use. So it's a, you know, there is no threshold of what's too much or, or anything like that. But, you know, this is, you know, with the use of plastics in those products, you know, you've seen the exfoliating body washes and stuff. Those actually have plastics in them. Um, and with the use of those, there's concerns about how do you treat those, handle those. Um, so a portion of this grant will look at what, you know, how good of a job our system does in the treatment process and handling things like that. The other portion of this is to look at public perception of the use of wastewater. Um, as an example, and I think I used this one last time, you know, the western part of the country is having significant problems with farming because of drought. So, the, you know, there's a question of whether, you know, what public perception would say about the use of treated wastewater in the um, irrigation of foods that could be for human consumption. Um, right now, you can use it on things such as forestry, which is what we do. Um, I know that we've toured several plants that use their their crop is hay. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the others? Those are the two big ones I've seen. Those are the big ones. Um, so this the part of this is a public perception piece. Um, we've met with. Um, representatives from NC State, including Dr. Rishash, um, who had to apparently take an ethics course to receive the grant. Um, and we've been notified that we received the grant. They've actually, um, or that NC State's received the grant. Um, there is a, um, they've sent me a draft scope for us to look at. Obviously, this would have to go to city council for formal acceptance, so that's probably something we'll look at getting to them in uh, August. Along with that, um, it does not require any match from the city, although I'm sure that, you know, we'll have probably not money, but some staff time tied up because we do have um, a dedicated interest in this. You know, part of what could come out of this, if our system does as well as some of the researchers think, is there opportunities there for um, other uses of our effluent, you know, whether that be in small farms near here, other um, privately owned uh, timber plantations, um, or others in the area. So it does give us an opportunity to look at, and possibly even application rates in our own irrigation fields that we currently have. So the, you know, there's some definite benefit for the city, um, but what as part of this, the public perception piece, one of the things that they'll ask the city to do is put together a technical committee, which will be fairly small and mostly a few staff members from our staff and a, a few staff members from NC State, and possibly we even talked about a regulator from the state being part of kind of a technical committee, but then there's an overall larger committee that they would like to look at, and that would kind of be the study. Um, and those could include surrounding landowners, um, farmers in the area, farmers from outside of the area, citizens from the city. So there's a, a second group that would be have to be identified for um, the public perception component of this. Did I leave anything out? That's essentially where we are now. We're probably looking at not even getting started until the August September time frame, anyways. Um, September. So, um, but I wanted to keep you up to date on where we're at. And of course, like I said, now that NC State physically has the grant and the money, we'll go to um, to council to bless the. Um, basically the memorandum of understanding and um, 
and update them on it uh, as well. Who gave the grant? NIFA, the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. The feds. Oh. The feds. EPA is a part of that also. It's a, I think it's a joint effort between them and EPA. And so what you talked about just now, that's all I've heard about it, is uh, our benefits are potential, right? I mean, we don't get any, there's nothing, I didn't hear anything good for us. They weren't going to give us well, money or anything directly. Yeah. I mean, it's just. No, it's mainly uh, into the research, uh, it, yeah. doing the sampling and all of that, but a, a, a potential future benefit potential. is uh -huh. addressing some of the future development and growth of the area. If, if we're, we're limited to the land application site, how could that increase the potential uses for that water, either on the site or in surrounding areas? Do they pick us and other people, or is it they, just They actually just, just picked pick us, us because we've done other things with NC State. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's a land application site? It's one of the largest right. land application right. sites. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's the full expectation that our system does so well based on what they've seen being a part of our site. And, and NIF is part of USDA. Yes. Are they going to be doing the testing or are they? Yes, no, they would be doing it. Our involvement, we would not have, you know, we have direct responsibilities with the Blue Frog that we talked about going out initially daily and monitoring them three times a week and then once a week. We would not have, they would be able to collect a lot of the data through things that we already do. There may be some additional sampling that we have to do, but it would probably be minor. And they're hiring a postdoc that'll have a three-year position, uh, and that postdoc will be coming down, doing the sampling, doing the analyses, and um, that'll be that person's project for three years. Any other questions? Thank you. Sounds good. And all you have, Wally, I'm kind of Okay, new business. I have one thing here that goes back to the meeting in March. Uh, Mr. Henson provided the committee members with an update on the land treatment site, which included information about emergency spraying and the blue frog bio slug removal technology. We discussed that earlier tonight. The committee decided that once the blue frog system is installed and operational, they would like to go out to the site and see it. Does committee still want to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes. He's talking about okay. when yeah. Wally can you set up. I'm something. planning for so um, just a, a quick update. We I know that we didn't have last month's meeting or the month before that. Some of the items we had tonight we actually had scheduled for last month. And when I looked at our schedule. I didn't see that the time was pressing for the items to get to you. So I canceled last month's meeting. My plan was to have this month's meeting, recognizing it might go a little longer. And then my thought would be city council's not meeting at, at least the first meeting in July. My thought would be that this board would probably enjoy having July off. And then we would meet in August. And my plan for August was to meet at land application site if you're interested. So you're saying we may not have a meeting then in July? Correct. Okay. So but we're I looking send for, you for we're looking notification. for August. And, and we would set everything up um, for you in August. And there's been um, some discussion of whether we could possibly have a joint meeting in August at LTS with the, the council. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure whether that will that work out nice. or not. Mm -hmm. But if possible, we possibly would set that up. Okay. The under new business on WASA, as I have advised before, is only having their meetings every two months now. The last meeting we had, they did not have any new permits, so there was no nothing there. And the next meeting will be this coming Tuesday, so I should have something then in August if we have new permits and all that they're having. Um, the planning and permitting update that's in your minutes for your report now the main thing was the proposed 
courthouse expansion for almost 60,000 square feet. That's going to be down, if you know where the Pelletier house is at, mm -hmm. just, okay, it's going to be in that area there from the back of the current Somersill building. It's going to take in the parking lots and all that, from what I, I was informed of. Um, Will it take out that little street? No. It should take off part of that, I believe, doesn't it? It's not going to. No. See, we don't get they to see about, any of this they anymore. They about taking in and out, but no, they're not going to close it. Well, the parking lot's by the Pelletier house, and the courthouse is here, and that street runs in between. So, so how are they not? Be, it won't be near the Pelletier house. It's going to be adjacent to them. Just the courthouse on that side of that street, the courthouse side How of the street. How about where the old jail was that they made into a parking lot? Is that going to be included there? I haven't seen the plan. I just know they're not taking out any. So. <laughs> I haven't seen it either, so I don't, we don't get to see anything anymore on the plan. It's all done by staff, and they don't show us. So the only the first time I see it when we get it right here. Are those three homes going to stay there? I think there's three homes that are on the old tax office side by the no, USO. The tax office, you're way down the you're down the road. Yeah, you're down. No, the road. it's That's it's Tallman. the old bridge side, not the Tallman Street side, not the USO side of that no, little street. No, it won't be down there. Over far. on the side where the bridge is, where the church and all is. Okay, that side of it. Okay. There's a small parking lot for where some of the judges park yep. right there. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. That's going to, I'm, I'm sure, going to be taken in. And I think part of that parking lot where the old jail was that they tore it out, that's going to be part of it also. But I haven't seen the plans yet. I've asked Ryan about them and yeah, got a little bit here and there about it. Um, Is that 60,000 square feet as in? the whole footprint or is that multiple stories I, well i don't even know if it's going to be a two i imagine it'd be a two-story like the current one is do you know or any of you no you're gonna have to check with the county actually because the uh, city is nobody wants to tell you anything about well, it really it, it, the county's going to handle all the inspections and the approvals and stuff yeah. that construction have you seen the new Hospital. Social services yeah, over there by the hospital, that is going right along. That's getting huge. It's amazing because they put it like right on the corner. Yeah. It sits right but sitting see, on the street. Now, I've seen the plans on that. The whole back of that with the old hospital and everything, mm -hmm. that's all going to be parking lot. Yep, it's that's all going to be parking lot. So they're going to have a pretty good amount there. Um, there's going to be, as you can see on here, an academy sports it's going to be a 62,000 square foot behind Krispy Kreme, back there between Krispy Kreme and the theater down there. Uh, Panda Express <laughs> restaurant and drive through will be. Where did y'all? It's, did a, it's near the same area. Western Form is right in the same area of Krispy Kreme. Right, yeah, that'd be the same. Okay. Is that but what you're calling the lower that. area of Western before it gets to Gum Branch? Is that what you're calling that? No, it's. Uh, it's right there in front of the new movie theater, the Patriot. That's Park. what you're calling Western Forum. That's correct. Yeah, okay. That area up to where Henderson comes in, does that include that too? That I believe that's a that. separate landowner. Okay. I think so it's the area where the theater and the Krispy Kreme are. Yes. And that, and it extends over to uh, Buffalo Wild Wings. Oh, okay. All right. So that, that stretch in there. Gotcha. What about there behind the um, state employees credit union? I noticed they were clearing some of that off. I'm not sure if it goes, Western Form goes all the way over to, um, to there what's that Dennis Road. Because that's right where the light is into Carolina I'll Forest. To, I'll have to get more information for you on that. I've got one question, Pete. Sir. That 36-inch pipe that runs out the land tree treatment. Yes, sir. That's been in the ground for 20 plus years, not 21 years or something like that. Yes, sir. What if we have a leak or something there on that? Is there any pipe, any valves, anything in stock to fix it, or does that? Yes. <laughs> I, have, I, have, it's opener. I have materials to fix it on site or in stock. I have some stored at the public services complex. I have some pipes stored at uh, the wastewater plant out at LTS. Um, I have a 
Contingency plan written in pencil, depending on where the leak is and what time, and everybody answering their phone on the first ring. Uh, but realistically, I'll give you the same answer that I gave city council during a workshop one night. I dig a really big hole and I contain it yeah. until I can get it fixed. That's all I can do. The well, only the only valves on that entire line is at the main pump station where we can divert it to the EQ basin or on either side of the river. That's the only valves in that line. Now that behind the pump station, where we got a two million gallon? Two and a half. Two and a half million. Two and a half million gallon equalization basin. That's two thirds of a day or so, three that'll quarters me, of a that'll day. That'll give me eight hours. Eight hours? <laughs> Because we, we keep some we keep some we keep some water uh, in the EQ basin to keep everything wet because it it needs to stay moist. Yeah. Um, so we have about seven feet in there, roughly, and then so that'll give me on a conservative side it gives me eight hours, and I need at least eight hours. Again, if everybody picks it up on the first ring, I need a minimum of eight hours to get it fixed. There's two million gallons of wastewater between the main pump station and the headworks at LTS, and that pipe is full. It stays full. There's two million gallons that I have to try to dig a hole and contain. Wow. Until I can get it shut down and diverted. <laughs> Big hole. Big hole. Uh, is there any talk yet about extending out from Western Boulevard? I know we talked about it at one time. Uh, going through Burton, you know, under the yes. river in Burton Park and all. I think that the county's finally. You want to take that, that one more? Sure. Later? The project's, um, the project design is um, just a, was well, just about complete we are actually working on um, obtaining easements from residents along the um, route of the force main pump station the new pump station will it's a three-part four-part project um, the new pump station will sit in the um, Williamsburg Plantation area. The force main will go across the river um, through Burton Park. The county's already given us easements for that. Um, and um, up, um, what's the road across Pony from that? Pony Farm Road. Um, we're going to leave Pony Farm Road and go across country to directly to the land application site. Um, a second part, portion of the project is the modifications at the headworks to handle the new pipe. Um, and then the fourth part of this project is a new gravity sewer that will extend from the uh, pump station in Williamsburg Plantation down the parkway, Williamsburg Parkway, um, and almost to, I think it goes almost to Carolina Force Boulevard. It, it comes out, it goes up Williamsburg Parkway to Western Boulevard, where the Williams, uh, Williamsburg and Western come together. It's going to be the beginning of the gravity there, and the new, new force main coming out of Carolina Forest is going to come down Western Boulevard and dump in right there at Williamsburg and Western Boulevard. So when the project's complete, it will divert Carolina Forest and that northwestern part of the city into that new pump station force main and carry it out kind of like a bypass mm -hmm. to uh, directly to land application site. And weren't you going to put in some interconnections so that the, the existing side could... That's go? a future project. Gotcha. That project does not have funding yet. Gotcha. Has permits already been applied for for that? Or? I know that the... Um, I know that we've attained the... Um, environmental documents that we need and I'm not sure about permitting process no, I know that I, I permit know is one time it said it would be a couple of years to, oh. to get permits so approved in another couple of years probably for the engineering drawing well the the, um, the biggest one is the environmental assessment that's what takes the longest and that has been completed typically the permits that follow that's Kind of the predecessor, the permits to follow it should take much less time to get. So how far are you from? I think digging, we're planning on shovel. construction and in winter. It's, it's I winter think it of seventeen, I think. Yeah, it goes out to bid. Of course, right. easements can. We have to obtain easements, so that one so could so be it'd difficult. Be a year and a half, something like that, maybe yes. two years. Yes, for construction. Okay. 
and we've talked about running the running multiple I, I talked about four different components we've talked about um, running starting the pump station force main or the headworks project first and then the pump station force main is a separate project that would uh, release shortly behind the first project and then the uh, trunk sewer would be released after the force main and pump station are started so we could have four or five separate contracts running concurrently but we'll delay the start because you have to start on the downstream portion first. Do you want to make any comment on this? Okay. <laughs> Do we have anything else to be brought up tonight? Next month that we are not going to have the meeting was for elections. So that will be put off now That'll until August. August. That's correct. For chairman, vice chairman. And it basically, the all we have to do is at the first meeting following July 1. Yeah, that'll be August. Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. I make a motion we adjourn the meeting. I'll <laughs> second. I'll third. <laughs> we, have, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting closed.